Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. Well, this morning we begin a new section in the book of Acts. Until now, the spotlight has been on the church of Jerusalem. And until now, the spotlight has actually been on the apostles of Christ, men like Peter. But starting in the 13th chapter of Acts, this is all about to change. The ministry of the apostles and the church of Jerusalem, it actually begins to fade away, fade into the background. Because the Gentile ministry and the ministry of the apostle Paul now moves to center stage. The church of Jesus Christ is beginning to move out, beginning to fulfill the command of Christ to take the gospel of Christ to the ends of the earth. Less than two weeks ago, Pastor John Alford of Sanford Memorial Baptist Church in Virginia and his wife, 76-year-old Nancy Alford, the couple came home in the morning at about nine and discovered two men inside of their home. Nancy was forced to drive to a nearby credit union and withdraw about $1,000 dollars. Once they got back to the house, once they got back to the home, Pastor John was actually beaten up and the couple was tied up. And then the house that they had lived in together for 40 years was set on fire. The attackers fled and the pastor, he managed to free himself and escape the burning home. He tried to desperately return for his beloved wife, but the neighbors who found him beaten and swollen And bleeding were convinced the fire was too far gone. And members of the church were questioned by the media. One described the attack as an evil thing and said that he had no doubt that as Pastor John and his wife Nancy were going through this entire ordeal, that they would have been the first ones sharing Christ with the people that attacked them. Members of the church are praying, praying for their pastor who is now in stable condition, but still suffering from second-degree burns from the fire, but also praying for these two men. And then one of the members ended by saying this. He said, we know Satan is evil, and we're not going to let that prevail and overcome us. This morning I want to talk to you about defending against the fiery darts. Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark ran into the opposition of Satan in our text. The Bible says this, that Satan, the thief, does not come except to what? Steal, to kill, and to destroy. Since the dawn of creation, Satan has had one goal, to stop and to corrupt the work of God. Christians today are the primary target. Stopping the gospel of Christ, stopping the work of Christ. So what do you do when Satan attacks? What do you do when the fiery darts come? Let's answer this question this morning. We begin in verse 1, where we read that in Antioch, the leadership of the church consisted of five men. Luke describes them as prophets and teachers. Now, Barnabas and Saul, they're not new to us. Simeon was also called Niger, his Roman name, a dark-skinned man. Lucius of Cyrene, he would have been from the northern coast of Africa. But look at the note that Luke gives us about Manaen, brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. That's an interesting little footnote that Luke gives to us. Now, this was not Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill Jesus as an infant. This was not Herod Agrippa from chapter 12 of Acts. This was Herod Antipas. He was another son of Herod the Great. He ruled over Galilee and Perea. He was the guy, if you remember, he was the one who had John the Baptist killed. And he was the one who put Jesus on trial. Herod Antipas mocked the Christ and sent him back to Pilate. 
And the wording tells us that Manaen was raised in the same home of Herod Antipas. He was on the high end of things, on the high end of that social scale. Manaen and Herod were actually raised together. At one time, they would have been very close. Think of the collection of men that God was using to lead this church. We have men from different continents. We have men with different colored skin. Mana N was from the extreme upper class, raised by a family that was deadly opposed to Jesus Christ. And then you had Saul of Tarsus. This diverse group of men from all different backgrounds in all different parts of the Roman Empire were serving the Lord and fasting. They had learned to come together and serve Jesus Christ as one. Verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The servants of God ministered to the Lord. The servants of God fasted. And the Holy Spirit of God had set apart Barnabas and Saul to a work that God had for them. They had proven themselves in the local church, in their teaching, their character. Their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ was obvious for everyone to see. Just the Spirit of God using men of faith. Nothing wrong with that at all. But what does it mean here that the Holy Spirit said or that the Holy Spirit spoke? Was there an audible voice? Was this the Holy Spirit speaking to the hearts and minds of these men? Or was something else going on? Well, I believe the answer is actually found in the context. Verse 1 had just told us that there was prophets there. We saw this in chapter 11. Prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Listen to it again. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. The Holy Spirit revealed to this prophet the coming famine. This is actually the pattern that you see in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit speaking, how? Through the prophets. One more example for you. In Acts 28, Luke recorded the words of Paul. And it says there in verse 25... So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. Notice this next part. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through who? Isaiah the prophet to our fathers. The Holy Spirit spoke through Isaiah the prophet. You see, the Spirit of God speaking to men in the Bible is not an audible voice in a church service. It was the Spirit of God speaking through one of his prophets. Doesn't Peter actually tell us this when he wrote in 2 Peter? For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as how they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, the Spirit of God speaking, was God the Spirit moving the prophets to speak. And this is what we have back in Acts 13. Not this audible voice in the service, but the Spirit of God moved the prophets to speak the words that God had set upon their hearts and their minds. Again, verse 3, they fasted, they prayed, they laid hands on these men. There's nothing mystical taking place here with this. The laying on of hands was simply to identify that they recognized the call of God was upon these men. On June 1st of 1965, a tiny 13 and a half foot boat quietly slipped out of the marina from Massachusetts And its destination was England. It would be, and still is, the shortest boat ever to make the trip. Its name, I love it, was the Tinkerbell. The man who sailed it was Robert Manry. Now, Robert was, I like this guy, he was a copy editor, but he got bored with his job. (laughs) Who doesn't, right? He got bored. So he decided to take a leave of absence to do something big and bold. And he decided to sail across the Atlantic. Now, he was afraid. He was deathly afraid, not of the ocean, but that people would try to talk him out of the trip. So he didn't tell many people. Just a few relatives, but mainly he told his wife, Virginia. Virginia. 
Well, as you can imagine, this trip was anything but pleasant. He spent sleepless nights trying to cross the shipping lanes without getting run over. That's a problem. Loneliness caused him to have hallucinations. His rudder broke three different times. Storms swept him overboard, and had it not been for a rope that he had tied around his waist, he would have never made it back on board. Finally, after 78 days alone at sea, he sailed into England. And all he wanted to do, you've been there, all he wanted to do at this point was check into a hotel and eat dinner alone. That's all he really wanted. And then he thought about maybe going down to the Associated Press to just see if they might happen to be interested in his story. But as he approached England, three hundred vessels with horns blasting escorted the Tinkerbell into port. Forty thousand people stood lining the shore screaming and cheering him to shore. And it's, you see what I'm saying is I think that's part of what we have here. Under the direction of the Spirit of God they were about to send Saul and his team out on a mission that seemed absolutely impossible. In 15 years since the birth of the church of Jesus Christ, the gospel had not, it had not been carried out throughout most of the known world. But here the church stood, praying, encouraging them. Someone once said this, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you, but encourage me and I will not forget you. That's a sign of a healthy church. When believers are standing behind those that are serving and encouraging them, praying for them, helping them minister in the name of Jesus Christ. If you want to tear a church down, it's easy. Be critical. Be in it for yourself. Come for your own reasons. And if you want to see the church of Jesus Christ mature into all that he wants to see it become, be a part of the solution. Amen. Stand behind one another. Lift up one another and pray for every member of this church every day. So watch the journey that these guys went on in verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. From there, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they had arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Again, notice the focus. Sent out by who? The Spirit of God. And first, Paul and Barnabas went down to Seleucia. Now you can see that Antioch was actually up the river a little ways. Not right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. But just 16 miles down the road was Seleucia. And that is what Luke is telling us here in verse 4. He says that they sailed from Seleucia to Cyprus, about a 130 mile trip. But there's a couple of things that we need to remember about the island of Cyprus, this big old island off of the coast. Barnabas, if you remember, was from Cyprus. This wasn't new ground for Barnabas. And remember what we saw back in chapter 11 when Jews fled the persecution of Saul years before this, some of them ended up on the island of Cyprus. But this was also home ground for some of the church at Antioch. Some of the people were from there. So if you've ever stopped and looked at Acts and wondered, well, why did Saul and his team first go to an island? Why was that the first stop? This is why. This was their backyard. But here we get to another detail that testifies of the absolute accuracy of God's word. Because in the Roman Empire, there was two basic types of Roman provinces. First, there was the imperial provinces, which were under the control of the emperor himself. And they had legions of troops stationed there. And they were ruled locally by governors that were appointed by the Roman emperor. This is what we saw in our study in Acts chapter 12, an imperial province ruled by Herod Agrippa. Then the other type of province was the senatorial provinces, which were just as the name sounds under the control of who? The Roman Senate. Now these provinces had no legions of troops stationed in them, and they were administered by proconsuls. History teaches us that Cyprus was a senatorial province, and it had a proconsul that answered to the Senate, which is exactly what we're going to see in a few verses that Luke records. Subtle details in the text that should build your confidence in the Word of God. They landed in Salamis, 
And here they began the pattern that Paul would follow throughout his entire life as a missionary. When he could, Paul always began his ministry in a new town by first preaching in the local synagogues. There you could explain how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament messianic prophecies. There was a decent Jewish population in Salamis, several synagogues there. But notice how Luke adds a little detail that John Mark was with them, their assistant in ministry. So they moved on, verse 6. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Salamis is where they landed. And then down on the opposite end of the island was Cyprus. Of Cyprus was Paphos, about a 90-mile hike. This was actually the capital of Cyprus. And they preached Christ as they made their way across this island. And then they came to Paphos. Paphos is still there. It's been upgraded slightly since then. But it was a fairly new city at the time. It was rebuilt because an earthquake, you guys are pretty familiar with those here, it had been totally destroyed by an earthquake, so it had to be rebuilt seven miles to the southeast. Now, Paphos was the seat of the Roman government on the island, and Luke informs us that the proconsul at that time was a man by the name of Sergius Paulus. Now, Sergius himself, he came from a family that was very influential in the Roman Empire. And back in the year 1877, an inscription was found by the area of Paphos, which not only named Sergius Paulus, but it also had his title of proconsul. And then 10 years later, his name was also found on a memorial stone in Rome that speaks of his service to the Roman Empire after his service as proconsul. And we also know that his family owned a large amount of land up by Pisidian Antioch. And sure enough, guess what was found there? A stone inscription which contains his name, and this inscription is now on display in a museum in Turkey. So here's what I'm driving at with all that. It makes you wonder when we get to verse 14, not in today's study, but as the study moves forward, why did Paul and Barnabas head up to Pisidian Antioch where Sergius had family? It leaves many to think that the reason was he may have asked Paul to actually go there to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with his family. But here in our text, we have a spiritual battle taking place. Verse 7 tells us that Sergius called Barnabas and Paul, and there must have been a lot of commotion. That's all we can deduce from this text. There must have been a lot of chatter. There must have been a lot of talk about what Paul and Barnabas were teaching. And Sergius wanted to hear it. He wanted to hear the word of God. But notice the end of verse 6 and the first part of verse 7. It teaches us that Bar-Jesus was with the pro-council. Look at the description of this guy, quite the description. He was a Jew, he was a false prophet, he was a sorcerer. The wording indicates deception, a man claiming to be something that he was not, claiming to be a prophet of God, one who claims to speak on behalf of God but has no connection with God. This is probably a man who practiced astrology, divination, and the interpretation of dreams. And if he did have any real power, we know that they most certainly did not come from God because he would have been involved in the occult. But why would a Roman official have a man like this with him? Why would he be attached to such a guy? It reminds me of the story that a Kansas newspaper told, the Wichita Eagle. There's the source of all your news, the Wichita Eagle. It reported about a pond in the middle of a housing development. Now, this pond was kept stocked with fish. And somewhere along the line, a child had thrown a toy basketball into the pond. Not a full-sized one, not a big one, but a smaller one. And it had rolled into this pond. And one of the residents saw this ball just kind of bouncing around up and down in the water. And all he could see was that it looked like this ball was just moving around and popping up and down all by itself in the water. And curiosity got to him after a little while. He had to go look. He had to go see what was going on. And what he found was that a large flathead catfish had tried to swallow the ball. But it had gotten stuck in its mouth. 
Now catfish, they like deep water, and normally they swim down at the bottom. So for some reason... This catfish, he must have come up to try to swallow the ball, and now he's trying to dive back down repeatedly to the bottom. But he couldn't do it. He got stuck like a buoy. Because the ball would always just bring him right back up to the surface of the water. And this fish, he literally wore himself out trying to get back down to the bottom of this pond. Which, by the way, I think is a perfect description of the futility of man as they attempt every single possible solution to fill the hole left in them from the sin nature. You see, mankind wears themselves out looking for ways to be reconciled to God by works. Looking for ways to be at peace with God their way instead of by faith in the Son of God. And so we see them bobbing along in life attached to some pretty strange things. Buddha, evolution, Scientology, the list is endless. And this is what we have with this Roman proconsul. Luke even tells us that Sergius was an intelligent man. He was discerning, keen enough in his own understanding that he wanted to hear from Barnabas and Saul. He wanted to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear for himself. Now put yourself into the mindset of the Roman world. The people looked up to those that claimed to have these powers. And being a Jew meant he was attached to a historic faith. The closer a belief is to the truth, the more dangerous it is. The Romans loved to have men like this. Men that Luke describes as a false prophet. Men that claim to be able to know the future. Because the future is always what we do not know. We cannot know the future. The future is what brings worry to those without faith. So the Roman leaders like to keep these guys around. But Bar-Jesus had another name. Take a look at verse 8. Here comes the fiery darts of Satan. But Elamas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Elamas, the sorcerer, one who claimed to predict the future, this was his Greek name. Now, Sergius had swallowed everything that this man was telling him. Bar Jesus, his other name, he was a sorcerer that used deception to try to draw people into himself, to receive the glory for himself that belongs to God alone. And that's what prideful people do, that's what lost people do. This Jewish magician sought to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. A descendant of the very people that God had set apart for himself. He should have known that the word of God forbids everything that he was doing. In his name, it meant son of Jesus or son of a savior. And here is the danger that is outlined for us. You can say all the right words. You can be somebody that claims to know Jesus, but still be on the wrong team. This false prophet withstood Barnabas and Saul seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Satanic motivation. False prophets are always looking for money, and they're always looking for fame. They don't care about you. They care about themselves. And this false prophet, he could not afford to have his best customer convert to the Christian faith. Sergius, at this point, was not saved. But Bar-Jesus sought to prevent this conversion from happening. And this is where he made a serious mistake. Because Paul was a man who would not allow darkness to prevail. Paul was not a man who would allow the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to be outshined by the lies of Satan. Watch how Paul stood up to the opposition of Satan here. And how he defended the faith. Pick up the text with verse 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? I love the strength of Paul's words. This would get him kicked out of a lot of places today. Paul stood toe-to-toe with the man He looked him dead in the eye and told him he was full of deceit. He was a fraud. He was a counterfeit from the pits of hell. He was a son of the devil and an enemy of righteousness. Follow the careful wording here in the text. Not just Paul speaking on his own accord. 
Luke tells us very carefully in verse 9, Paul was filled, Paul was controlled by the Spirit of God. Meaning, listen, this was God's view of this man, not just the Apostle Paul. You see, God doesn't put up with the lies of Satan, and neither would the Apostle Paul. And think about how this applies to us. The description we are given of this man is one that would make a prophet. One that would turn people aside from the gospel of Christ for his own benefit. And the unmistakable lesson is that these men and women should be rebuked, not embraced by the church of Jesus Christ. All the false doctrine that is welcomed into the Western church today is a part of the reason you see people floundering and wavering in their faith, but never growing, never maturing. And I got to tell you, it's absolutely painful to watch. This man was not a son of the Savior. He was a child of the devil, an enemy of God. Paul stared him down and said, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? This is the old Hebrew expression that we see in Isaiah, a city would prepare for the arrival of a king by clearing the road ahead of time. This is the image, if you remember, given of John the Baptist. This was the ministry of John. He prepared the way of the Lord. But this man, he created obstacles. Paul was telling him, quit trying to divert people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, God had sent Paul and Barnabas to clear the way for Christ to redeem the Gentiles. But all that this man was doing was littering the road filled with obstacles, with deception and unrighteousness. So what did Paul do? Paul stared down the fiery darts from the gates of hell and he spoke the truth of Christ. He was confident. Not in himself, but his confidence came from knowing God, knowing what he believed, and knowing the truth of Christ. And here comes the irony. Paul makes a prediction about what was going to happen to this false prophet. Take a look at what he told him in verse 11. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. This was the hand of the Lord at work. Now this man was not only spiritually blind, but for a time he'd be physically blind. A dark mist fell on him. And verse 11 leaves us with the image of man walking around, groping in the dark, seeking for someone to help him. But we also see the mercy of God because this man's physical blindness was short-lived. God struck him with the same affliction that had seized Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Saul had become Paul. How would Bar-Jesus respond? We see the grace of God because this man deserved to die. He was a false prophet. This meant he deserved to die. And second, we remember that he was a Jew. He had access to the scriptures. He had access to the word of God. And he turned them down for the pagan mysteries of his day. It's the same sin that we see in the church. Christians turning down the word of God to take up the foolish thinking of the unredeemed. The witness to Sergius was strong. This false prophet could not even see that the hand of God's judgment was upon him. And the lesson that is set before us here in the text is that even though the magic and the superstition of the world, it seems powerful, they cannot stand up to the power of the living God. Here was a man that claimed to be able to see what others could not see, to know what others could not know, and he is left here helpless and unable to even look up and see the sun. He went from claiming to be able to see others to being led around like a child by the hand, see the power of God at work. When the proconsul saw what had been done, He came to salvation in Jesus Christ. But it wasn't the miracle. Note with me, it wasn't the miracle that had done it. Take a look at what Luke records at the end of the verse. Being astonished at what? The teaching of the Lord. The miracle, I'm sure, got this man's attention. No doubt about that. But it was the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ that astonished him. And as he listened to the teaching of the gospel of Christ, he believed he had faith is the meaning. He trusted the gospel of Christ. This was the first Gentile ruler in the book of Acts to believe. And from this point forward, Saul is mainly referred to as Paul. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. Paul was now moving into land that was mostly Greek-speaking 
Romans. And before this, Paul spent most of his time with the Jews. Paul would be the name that the Greeks and the Romans would recognize as Paul traveled across the Roman Empire. Now before this, Barnabas had always been mentioned before Saul. But from this point forward, Paul is listed first when in the Gentile lands of the Roman Empire. Being raised in Tarsus and a Roman citizen, Paul was now on his home turf. Paul and his group, they set sail from Paphos, arriving in Perga in Pamphylia. Adoniram Judson, not a student of church history, he was born in 1788. And he became one of the first to bring the gospel to the Burmese people, landing in Burma in 1813. In a land of millions of people at the time, it is said that there was not one Christian. I don't know about that, but I know there was very few there to be sure. He was actually warned by most of the mission groups in that day not to go there. It wasn't safe. En route, his wife had a miscarriage. Their baby was buried at sea. Once in Burma, his wife gave birth to their son, only to find themselves burying him underneath a large tree just a few months into their mission work. For the first six years in Burma, not one person came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And slowly with time, people did begin to accept the gospel of Christ. And after ten years of work, he was able to complete the New Testament in the Burmese language. And when war broke out with England, the Burmese people, they arrested Judson simply because he was light-skinned and he spoke English. He looked and he talked like the enemy. Judson was forced to march barefoot for eight miles to a prison where each night the guards would take a bamboo pole and put it between his legs while his legs were in shackles. And they would hoist the lower lower part of his body high off the ground, causing the blood to actually rush to his head, keeping him from being able to sleep and causing, can you imagine, these intense cramps in pain in his shoulder and his back. Clouds of mosquitoes would feast on the exposed flesh of his feet and his legs. And this type of treatment went on for almost two years. Now Judson, he survived in part because his wife was allowed to bring him food each day. And she pleaded continually with the guards for better treatment. A few months after his release, Judson's wife was weakened by smallpox and died of a fever in the year 1826. Six months later, their daughter died. Judson built himself a one-room hut in a jungle, and then he dug his own grave, he said, in case it became needed. And then he worked in solitude on finishing the translation of the Old Testament in the Burmese language. In 1834, Judson married his second wife, Sarah. In 1845, Sarah became ill and once sent on a ship back to America. Sarah died on that ship on her way back to the States. In the beginning of his ministry, for years, only a handful of people had shown any interest at all in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but yet he stayed on. He stayed on for a total of 37 years. Judson stayed the course. He endured the heat. He endured the persecution. And he witnessed for Jesus Christ in Burma. Now, if you wonder about the motivation, if you wonder about the commitment of a man like this, Judson himself once said that he never saw a ship sail without wanting to jump on board and go home. But listen to what he wrote in his diary in the toughest years of his life as he contemplated the thought of quitting. Judson wrote, quote, Life is short. Millions of Burmese are perishing. I am almost the only person on earth who has learned enough of their language to communicate the good news of salvation. Missionaries were rare in those days. The Burmese language was extremely difficult to understand. And Judson knew that whether he felt like it or not, this was the work that he had been called to do. Millions of people there needed to hear the gospel. Millions of people needed the word of God translated into their own language. And it's not that God could not use another But it is that Judson understood God's call upon his life. And so what did he learn to do? 
He learned to die to self and to live for the glory of God. There is a call of God upon the life of every believer here in this room. A call to righteousness. A call to uncompromising loyalty to Jesus Christ. A call to preach, or in other words, to share Jesus Christ and to support the work of God's church. We see it lived out in men like Judson, the Apostle Paul, and Barnabas. And I see it in some of your lives as well. It's an obedience that's not grounded in fear. It's not grounded in guilt. But it's an obedience to Christ rooted in love, rooted in hope, rooted in faith. And done under the power of God's strength working through us. And believers who have not yet discovered this privilege, this joy, this honor of serving Jesus Christ... I'm sorry, but I I believe you've missed it. You failed to discover the joy, the peace, and the contentment that comes by living for something. Let me say this, someone greater than yourself. Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one I pray that you find this joy that comes from walking with Jesus Christ from serving Christ I pray you stand in his truth stand for his gospel And take up the shield of faith, trusting and then applying his word, knowing that then you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.